Um, welcome to YIMBY Actions, Making Urbanism Anti-Racist, part of an ongoing conversation um, that started out of the Black Lives Matter movement and how our response and how do we incorporate that thinking into our daily lives and bring that into the organization and the organizing that we're doing at every level. Um, this chat is with uh, my friend Constantine Hatcher, who has been organizing with California YIMBY for a few years now. Um, we have been in the trenches together. Together. We have argued, we have uh, helped one another, we have done so much work together. Constantine, I'm so glad you could join us. Super happy to be here, especially for this conversation. I think it's just extremely important, especially in our line of work and our movement in terms of really um, pushing that envelope and making sure, to the, speaking to the title, making sure that we're making this movement as anti-racist as possible. Not not just not being racist, let's be clear, we're talking about anti-racist, which, which implies that level of proactivity. Um, and so, you know, this, this, thanks for having me. I appreciate you all having me and, um, and it's been a joy, so yeah. Yeah, so Constantine, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into this work and, and sort of why this is so important to you. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out, I stumbled into, no, I'm joking. Um, I, um, so I, I actually, really started with the, um, in this work uh, full-time as the, as, on the Obama campaign. Um, I was actually, uh, my first uh, job, I was a regional field director, which is like synonymous for organizing the campaign world um, for like half of Southern California. I had like, my region was like bigger, bigger than like other states. <laughs> but um, uh, it really just helped me like to cut my teeth in, in terms of seeing how organizing, how impactful, how important um, movement building is and, and really how the power of folks when they come together around a common set of goals um, and, and put the put a little elbow grease in is how you can really move mountains. And I got to see that firsthand. And that to me by far, like empowering volunteers, empowering people to really own their voices, to really step up and be heard and demand that they are listened to. Um, that drove me. That was just so inspiring. And I and just I said, this is what I got to do. This is, this is, this needs to be my life's work. And um, so, yeah, I, I started with there with the Obama campaign, ended up going to on to be the uh, operation vote director in 2012 in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, really that was all about constituency organizing and, and, and making sure that we are really building a movement amongst folks that are often marginalized. Um, and, and, and then coming back, I go into that process, coming back and doing a bunch of local campaigns and issue advocacy um, here locally in LA across the state um, and then some other national projects along the way as well. Um, it's really helped me understand how organizing can look and how important it is um, to really make sure that, that, that folks know how to do it and feel comfortable doing it and really empower themselves to, to, to really take, take the, take take control and seize control of the power that they really have. And so the biggest piece is just making people understand that they actually have a significant amount of power um, if they just, you know, are, aren't afraid or, or, you know, aren't too busy to step forward and, and, and be heard. And uh, talk to me about how that applies. I mean, I think it's very obvious for me, but for other people, you know, bringing that experience into the housing movement, you know, this whole organizing an entirely new constituency to be lobbying, I think, you know, getting people to say we need housing in our community is it, the the direct transfer makes a lot of sense to me. You know, was it something that was easy to fall into, or how did you you know talk to me more about oh, yeah. getting into the housing aspect? Especially relevant. Yeah, no, it was. I mean, it was especially something close to my heart, um, just because of my background and, and you know, my parents were when I was a kid able to you know they had a choice they could make whether they could stay in one place and and you know, buy a home in a particular community, or you know, move around and try to find better educational opportunities for me and my brother, which they which they chose the latter. Um, and you know, to my great benefit, I was able to have access to great educational opportunities. And I chose to do the same thing for my sons as as you know they were growing up to really find communities where they could really have great access to education. Mm -hmm. um, that was my choice as a parent. And I was something that I wanted to have that it was great that I had that opportunity to be able to make that decision. Um, I look at them now as they're, you know, now young men and hopefully not too soon, but we'll start starting families of their own. 
there's just no way in the current with the current housing crisis that they can make that choice. And it's just not fair that, you know, my kids, um, other kids, um, other parents, um, other grandparents, um, folks from all across the spectrum, from your doctors and nurses to the most vulnerable among us that are being pushed down the street because of this crisis, um, that they don't have housing options. They don't have a place to go. There's no, there's no respite for them. There's no end unless we change what we, you know, what is this crisis if we don't come with real solutions. And so it was easy for me um, to, to jump into this because it's something that, you know, I very clearly saw um, how important secure housing is from a personal um, perspective, but also everywhere you go, I mean, it starts with your home, right? How do you, do you have a home? Do you feel comfortable? Are you living where you want to live? It's just a basic fundamental right that folks should really have. And so, well, if you're right about schools, I mean, I think this is the part that is so, you know, that we're more segregated than we were 20 years ago is so disturbing. And the amount of the, that, that tying together of access to high performing school districts that housing is so tied in with, are you going to be able to, and you know, in this resource, we talk about resource hoarding, we talk about opportunity hoarding all the time. And what does that actually mean for the individual person's life? You know, when you're talking about somebody not being able to get into a high performing school district because of, you know, why is your zip code destiny? It's like all of these things that are locked up in the opportunity hoarding that is happening. So and let me be clear, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody has to choose to move to a different school. Like you should also be able to be in your community and, and, and raise your family there and have access to good jobs, um, good schools, good services, good hospitals, good food choices, all the things that we don't have. And so shaking it up, it, and I think that's where like making urbanism anti-racist comes in and in terms of thinking about this, like it's not, it can't just be about how do we get more people in the high opportunity areas? How do we bring opportunity to areas that have been long starved of it um, because of racist housing policies of the past, right? So that it's not just that we're keeping people in these neighborhoods, folks in these neighborhoods, it's that we're also stripping away opportunity away from them. So how do we make sure that as we are looking at housing from a, from a holistically, that we can bring up and lift up neighborhoods that have been historically disadvantaged because of government action and interference. Yeah, and I also think, you know, the high displacement neighborhoods, right? Those are neighborhoods where there is quite a bit of opportunity because they're under this pressure that's happening where people want, you know, they're like, I mean, in, in San Francisco, they're transit rich neighborhoods, they're jobs rich areas that have historically been disinvested in and historically um, been lower income and are now under this incredible displacement pressure. How do we, like, I think that this is, it's, you know, Yimbies, we have to talk about everything at the same time too, right? It's like housing, it's, you know, it's intersectional, it's multifaceted, but it really is that like, okay, we can actually do both provide opportunities to the high income neighborhoods and reduce the pressure so that people can stay in the neighborhoods that they love that, that do have amazing opportunities. And I think that's, I think that's kind of when you think about this movement and what I'm excited to see us get more into is how do we, how do we make sure that redressing the ills, the, the ills of the past are front and center um, in, in these communities that are facing this kind of pressure? How do we make sure that those folks that are in those communities, now that, the, that there are opportunities there, that they get to stay and enjoy some of that great opportunity that's coming, right? And so how do we make sure that we are, you know, walking and chewing gum at the same time, so to speak? Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's a conversation that the Yimbies have not always done well. You know, it's like, how do we, <laughs> I think that's probably understating it, um, but that there, there's room for growth, let's say, uh, yeah. in how do we um, talk with communities? And I think it's with, right? I think there is totally, we should absolutely acknowledge there's a history of talking at people and, pro and the internet is all people talking at people too. But I think that, you know, we have had a history of, you know, let me show you my chart and tell you why you should think what I think. Um, yeah. I'll just leave it there and let you talk. Yeah. <laughs> and, and let me just say, like, as a, as a rule, that is absolutely the wrong way to, to, to approach that conversation with, with, 
with, with diverse communities because really when you're showing up in a community, um, a diverse community that, that is, you know, the BIPOC community that is, you know, that, that, that has been kind of subject to, to this kind of systemic racist pressures um, and trauma, um, the worst thing you can do is show up and talk at somebody, right? Because what you need to do is take a step back and first build relationship and build trust. And the way you do that is to first is show up and listen um, and, and, and actively listen and make sure that, you know, as you're hearing that how, where can you incorporate some of what you're hearing into what you're proposing, right? And so if, if you show up just saying, you know, hey, I have the plan, here it is, that's gonna go over like a ton of bricks in, in a pool, right? Um, so you, you, you don't absolutely don't wanna do that. You have to start off with building trust and building trust is actually really, um, really engaging and, and listening to what's, what some of the lived experiences are of people that, are, that people are having, right? Because oftentimes we think of policy, it's numbers on a spreadsheet, it's, you know, over 10 years, we'll see this amount of housing growth and this will relieve this kind of pressure. But that doesn't change the fact that, you know, my grandmother lives here right now, what's gonna happen to her? right? Or my sons are just about to graduate from college, where are they going to live, right? And so um, you, you, you have to really make sure that you are, are, are showing these, these, these communities listening about what their lived experiences are, and making sure that you're thinking about that as you're starting to look, as you look through the numbers on the spreadsheet, right? And I'm, I'm an organizing guy, you know, we, I'm very data heavy, um, and, you know, if, it, if, it, if the data, if, it, if, it's, if the data hasn't been entered, it doesn't exist, it didn't happen, all those things. But at the same time, um, it can't be the data isn't the only story, right? And oftentimes, what we also have to you see a lot of this, uh, 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 um, you know, of, of literature and, and, and articles about this now is that oftentimes data can be misleading based on what's what's in it, right? So if you're not having a cultural relevancy frame, your even your data sets. Um, you can really miss the mark because you, you know, if bad data in is bad data out. So you really want to make sure that those you're you're having that qualitative input as informed input and discussion on, on, on solutions as you start to think through it. And really and again, be proactive um, in, in uncovering those solutions. I think that proactive part, I think, you know, I've I definitely run to people who are like, oh well, I am listening, you know, I, I read all the tweets. And it's like, okay, well, that's not, you know, like that's a version of listening. It's better than like not hearing anything. Um, but I do think that people underestimate, you know, the the like direct, like, hey, I'm getting active in housing and this, you know, or, you know, I'm starting a Yimby Action chapter and I want to meet with you and ask you, what are you doing? What are your perspectives? What do you think we should be focusing on? That, you know, it's that it's that one-on-ones with people who are already active that will help you understand where the pitfalls are mm -hmm. and like have somebody not just be like, well, fuck that person, you know, that like you can really start in order to hear things, you have to build a relationship. I think like a lot of people are like, they have a one-on-one -on -one sometimes with just the goal to like wait for the gap where they can insert all of their statements as opposed to the like, let me see what information I can actually get out of this relationship. Absolutely, one hundred percent, and that's 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 so important. I think that, and it's you know it's having conversations outside of the comfort zone, right? So, not talking to the kind of necessarily like prototypical Yimbies, but talking to folks that may not even you know housing touches everybody. So if someone's community, you know actively engaged, even if it's not necessarily uh, a Yimby space or a super pro housing space. It's it's it, you still want to get that input. You still need to because housing affects everybody, and you want to you want to know how it's affecting communities. And so, you know, stepping outside of your comfort zone, talking to folks that may not disagree, that may not necessarily agree with you. Sometimes that conversation with someone that doesn't agree with you, that person can actually, in, after you get done building trust and talking through the issues and 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 and, and sharing ideas, that can ultimately be your strongest one of your strongest allies. So don't be afraid to get outside your comfort zone and talk to folks. Um, and, and, and really listen to, you know, what their experiences are, what, what impacts are they, you know, most concerned about, what are some of the things that are, you know, both perceived and real um, in their community that are the biggest things that are, are troubling their communities and stresses and pressures on their communities. So, you know, a perfect example of this is um, when I was 
when I showed up in Wisconsin, you know, I'm a California, Southern California guy going to like Milwaukee, like 90% of the black population um, is in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. And so, you know, showing when I, when I came to town, you know, I had, a, no one knew I had already, I had already written my plan, right? Like the plan, our operation vote plan was already written. However, when I went and met with like leaders, um, community leaders, some, you know, some, some state legislators and other, you know, labor leaders, all kinds of, you know, uh, religious leaders, and sitting down with them just to introduce myself um, and, and to really kind of make sure they knew that, that, that you know, I was there to listen and, and really engage them as partners. I didn't tell them I had my plan written. I, I, I asked them, the first question was, you know, what does this look like for you? How, what is success? You know, how can we be sure to like engage the community in a, in a real meaningful way? Now, the great thing about that, some of the things I had were part of my plan, they were, were reaffirmed. But the other part was I got some great tidbits for how to really be more effective in the communities that we were trying to serve. Um, so, you know, showing up, it's, it's, it's actually better not to have all the answers. You don't want that, because if you have all the answers, then you're not being, um, you're being disingenuous if you really want their input, right? Um, you can share ideas and thoughts that, you know, possible solutions, but you, but you really want to be in a position where you're listening in, 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 in a real authentic way. Um, and the other, other thing I'll say on top of that is, is, is meet people where they're at, um, you know, and, and, and talk to them in a language that they understand. Um, you know, we're, you know, we, we tend to be very policy wonky and we get the, you know, we have all the great terms and, but someone that's not necessarily in this space, that can be a real barrier to really wanting to participate. And they might, if, if we could break down what we're saying in, in terms that, that makes sense to them and in more layman's terms um, that aren't, you know, policy wonky, we'll actually could get a lot more folks to, they might, oh, okay, now I can understand that. I can, you know, I can be a part of that. And so really making sure that we're also, um, you know, meeting them where they're at, going where they're at, meaning talking to them in a the language that they understand, um, you know, framing our issues around things that are important to them. It's also incredibly important. I think, so we've talked a bit about, you know, that coalition building with people who are already active in the like housing adjacent space or, you know, people who we're going to need to work with as part of this coalition politics. Um, I think there's also another part to unpack um, about making our movement more diverse. And I think you, you started to go into this of, you know, how do we speak in more human language? How do we welcome people who don't have like, you know, an encyclopedic knowledge of every acronym related to housing, right? There's a lot that we can do to uh, help elevate within our own movement and, and help be welcoming to, you know, people who we need to be fighting for housing within the movement as well. Um, you know, I don't know if you, do you want to talk about any challenges that you faced in that and and sort of getting people active and, and getting people feeling like this is a movement for them? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that we, we have to be careful of is just how we talk to each other, you know, and, 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 and kind of that. And, and, and I'm not saying that you don't call people out when they're, when they're being obviously spreading misinformation, right? But you can do that. You can call out the facts and not the individual, if that makes sense. So we don't need to necessarily attack like sometimes, you know, we'll see that like, kind of like, oh, let's go, give me Twitter, let's go, attack, attack, let's go get them, right? And so one of the things we have to, but that, that can be a turnoff to folks that are not, you know, diehard NIMBYs, so, so to speak. And so we really want to make sure that we're creating that open and welcoming environment. And, and we can be, in just, I hate to use a, such a coin, uh, such a, coin phrase, but, you know, disagree without being disagreeable, if that's, <laughs> if that's a possible. And I, and I think that there's just space to do that. And I think that we really have to, um, you know, monitor our dialogue, even our internal dialogue, um, but, our, you know, our social media dialogue. And, and, and so that folks really do feel welcome. Um, and, and that we're not, and that we're not inadvertently um, being um, elitist in the, in the way that we talk. Right, and, and that we're not assuming that that we know about someone else's community. You know, that's the worst thing you can do. Worst thing, and, and and it starts with like building that trust, right? And so we can't, you know, it's, it's okay if folks mistrust you, and, and you can't take that person, and you can't get defensive. Um, what you can do is try to clear clear the air and really listen to what it is that 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 they're saying and get to the, the core of that. 
um, and that'll help lead you in the right direction. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's about showing up, number one, but it's also about how you show up um, in the space and you know, don't show up be, saying that you're the expert in their, about their communities, but really show up with, with a real intent, um, intention to, be, uh, to, to gather information, to really understand what their experience is. Um, and, then, and, then, and then the other part of that that's important is, is really focus on the values, right? Like those are, we really have a really defined set of values in this movement around inclusivity, around building in California, building in California that's really meant for everybody. And um, so we have to, to live that in the way that we talk and communicate with people. So if we can show up and focus on those shared values and find that common ground, that'll give us, start getting us in the right direction. Um, you know, as opposed to showing up with the graphs and charts and the data and saying that, yeah, that can come later. But the first thing is to focus on what's our shared values? What is the common ground? You know, why is this important? Why is it important to you? And why this is why I'm here and why it's important to me. Um, and when you find you start tapping into that, then you can really be in a position where you can start building that trust over time. You know, one thing that I think sort of a subtext that we're, what we're talking, you know, there's a lot of, and I think, you know, sometimes it's, it's really like justified, but it can also be addictive of the like self-righteous anger is a really big part of the movement as well. You know, I think we are dismantling history and, and patterns of segregation in our society. And when we're going into the, you know, opportunity hoarding, you know, the communities that are really straightforwardly, like places where I'm comfortable calling them NIMBYs, right? Like that's like, that's one space, right? Where we, um, you know, it's, it sometimes it's like, I'm yelling at my grandmother a little bit, right? And I'm like, you know, and I'm trying to like, be like, you know, here's how we can do better, right? I don't really want to be yelling. I want to be like, don't you not want to be terrible, right? Like, let's create more inclusive communities. I think that the, that's where I see the Yimby movement, like really comfortable in this, like, we're going to bring a bit of self-righteous anger, a bit of this is how we're going to dismantle barriers. This is how we're going to integrate communities. And there's like a lot of power and energy there. And where we consistently fall flat and struggle is in communities that maybe are building actually a decent amount of housing because they're in the places where we've been forcing the majority of housing to go for the past 30, 40, 50 years and who are struggling still with displacement because of all of the lack of housing in every other neighborhoods and navigating those relationships and also inspiring and getting them to feel like this is a movement for them. That's where we've like struggled a lot. And I do think that's a sort of like, what's the role of self-righteous anger in this conversation? Because I do think that we've actually been more successful than I would have thought at helping people see what's happening in the Palo Alto, the Cupertino, what's happening in Beverly Hills and helping people connect that to what's happening in the high displacement neighborhoods as well. And like being like, these two things are directly related, but in order to actually like, you know, connect with people and, 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 and see the world the way they see it, as well as being able to help them see it the way you see it, like that involves so many complicated interpersonal conversations where you build trust so that somebody can actually hear and understand what you're saying. Um, no, that's a really good point. And, and on, on that, like, you know, you can't expect that it's going to happen overnight. That's, that's not a, that's not a warm conversation. Woo, I got them on their own board. Like, no, that's a steady ongoing dedication to building that trust to really you know, bringing that information, being able to bring information, being so that you are a trusted messenger. Otherwise, if you're not a trusted messenger, no one's gonna listen to you. Even if you are saying things that might be benefit, that might benefit them. And you have to understand, you can't take that mistrust personally because you have to understand these communities have a long history of people saying we, you know, of of of, of patronizing po public policy, right? Where we're gonna do this for you, you know, and 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 nothing changes in the community. Things yeah. get worse over year over year, as we've seen time and time again, you know, we're talking about uh, 
the wealth gap widening, right? Generational wealth has declined. Educational opportunities have declined. Um, health opportunities have declined in these communities. So, you know, these people have been talking about how we're going, they're going to help them for many, many years and ain't nothing happening, nothing's changed. In fact, it's just gotten worse. So, you know, they have every right to be mistrustful and we shouldn't, you know, we can't take that personally, we can't get offended and we really can't expect that that's going to, we're going to change centuries of, 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 of trauma and distrust um, in, in, in two conversations. We have, to, we have to keep showing up. We have to keep listening. We have to then take what we hear and proactively turn that into action. Um, and let me say that again. We have to take what we hear and proactively turn that into action um, and, and, and keep coming back. And you know, even, 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 even if we get slapped the first time, that's okay, right? We're gonna come back and get more because eventually we're gonna win you over because we're gonna keep showing up and we're gonna keep showing up with that attitude, right? And so that's, and that's, and eventually people say, okay, you know what? We put y'all through the, okay, we'll listen now, right? And so you, you have to just keep at it. You can't, you know, when, when, and, and when you find folks that are, you have to understand that even allies are facing Tremendous, immense pressure from people around them, right? I know, you know, I, I can anecdotally tell of all kinds of stories where, you know, folks, minorities that have, you know, black and brown folks that have really been in support of our general concepts and policies, but they catch hell from their friends and their, and their networks for being supportive. So we have to understand that real situation that folks are in, in terms of, you know, even those that want to be supportive, um, they still have to manage their relationships. And so we have to, what we have to do is make it easier for them to manage those relationships. We have to give them the tools that they need to be able to be, um, uh, you know, pro-housing and supportive and, and NIMBY leaders. You know, I think also a point you made earlier was about showing up for their priorities, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, you know, figuring out that Venn diet, you know, okay, somebody doesn't necessarily want to talk to you. Okay, well, how do I demonstrate right, that I care about your values and that I'm, you know, and I think that we've done, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back, I would say, you know, like, I wish we had been doing this out of the gate, but it's good to grow, that I think we're doing a much better job um, proactively incorporating tenant protections into pro-housing bills. I think we're doing a much better job um, you know, showing up for consistently subsidized affordable housing in, I mean, I think we were doing that from the gate, from the get go, but I think, you know, we have even more turned that up. Um, actually, this, today I'm coming from a ribbon cutting ceremony where um, we uh, cut the ribbon on a new affordable housing project in the Mission District in San Francisco um, for 81 new families, which is just really, I got, I got pretty choked up. It was pretty beautiful. Yeah, there's 81 families that are going to have a place to live that's actually affordable for them. So that, that's, that's huge, especially for them. And I yeah. think, but I think that's absolutely right. I mean, and just, to, just to kind of hammer that point home, it's even sometimes when their priorities aren't necessarily our top priorities, um, we have to find room and in, in space within our work to make sure that we elevate those priorities as part of our work too. If nothing else, just to show that commitment to their priorities, right? It can't just be only when it totally benefits us. I mean, we, I'm not saying that we should support something against our values, right? That's that's definitely not what I'm saying. But I'm saying sometimes a win is is supporting a piece of of policy or or work or other type of work that is not necessarily our priorities, but it's something really important to a partner to show that solidarity, to show that that togetherness, to show, to help begin build that trust, and let them know that, hey, we're, we're here for you too. And it's not just a one way street. And people can smell that a mile away, right? Oh, uh, you know, that I'm just showing up to, to, you know, I just get you to sign off and I'm out of here, right? And so we really, you know, when you're thinking of, when we're thinking about like what we support and how we support them, um, and we're talking about being anti-racist, really elevating some of those priorities, some of these, of these communities um, into what some of the top tier priority work that we do. Yeah, so for you, I mean, what do you think that, um, you know, for Yimbies who are listening right now and who will watch the video later, you know, what's something practical that you think that any Yimby can do to really advance this anti-racist um, ideas, ideology? What, what, what can a person do uh, today, tomorrow to get this work done? Um, 
first the first step is just look at every, every community has you know in, in every part of our state there are there are communities of of, of you know bipoc folks, uh, organizations, folks that are in the community that are doing the work, that have been doing the work for decades in these communities, reach out and talk to them. Find out what their priorities around housing. Find out what some of the challenges their members see every day. You know, that, that's, that's something anybody can do. And, and the great thing is if, if you reach out and say, hey, you know, I'm in this organization. We, we're really trying to, you know, deal with this housing crisis. And I want to really know what, how this is affecting your communities. You know, what are some of the things that you're seeing that's the folks that you serve, what are some of the biggest issues that they find, that they're finding and encountering as they navigate the housing space? And the great thing is, and it doesn't necessarily have, that you don't need to limit it to a housing organization. Really, any community organization, housing is one of the things that they're dealing with because it really, really affects everybody across the board in such a profound way that there is something that they have seen and gathered in the housing space that's affecting their communities. And they may not be able to put it in all the, the fancy cute housing terminology that we use, but they, they will definitely have be able to tell you and have some ideas. So it, it just starts off with just starting to have conversations, showing up. Again, showing up is just so important. Um, you gotta show up first before you can take any action and do anything. You gotta be able to show up and talk to folks and listen to what their concerns are. And then, and, and then you can start having dialogue in terms of, well, how about this? Will this work? Is this, how might this affect that? You know, you know, how might this particular overall policy idea, you know, you don't have to necessarily get all into the specifics, but how might this overarching policy idea, you know, ease some of the tension of the folks that you service? And um, that's a great start and, and, you know, start building those relationships. I want to add, because I think that same mentality can also be, added, I think we don't do enough welcoming within the movement. You know, I think that and all of that applies to somebody shows up at your meeting for the first time or somebody joins the mailing list. What can we do more to make people know that they don't have to have a planning degree in order to like be super engaged and to, you know, be, a, I mean, it's much better if you don't have a planning degree, actually. Um, that is, you know, how do we help people tell their stories? How do we also make people feel, you know, I think the word entitlement is such a like word that I think about maybe too much because it's like, I want everyone to feel entitled to take up space in this movement, right? That means some people are gonna have to take up less space because we're going to have to be making more space for people who um, maybe aren't as tech savvy, maybe who aren't as engaged on social media, maybe who, you know, are from a wider age range, maybe who don't see themselves reflected enough in uh, the people who are active in this movement. How do we intentionally welcome and make people feel like they um, have a piece of this movement and, and that we want their stories, that like their stories are so critical. I think that's, that's, spot on, uh, Laura, in terms of thinking about like, how do we welcome folks into our ranks? And, and I think, you know, one being, uh, it's just being extremely welcoming, you know, talking to them, sharing your story, again, learning how to, 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 to tell your housing story and uh, around the values. And, and then the other side is like, is really talking to them and asking them about their housing story, ask them what, what, what their concerns are. It really works the same way as you're talking to, if you're talking to a new volunteer as it is you're talking to an organization. Um, maybe even more so in that you have an opportunity to really share an, an intimate moment in terms of your values and creating that, that relationship. Um, but then it's also, you know, list, really hearing some of their concerns and some of the things that they see and give credence to that, right? Um, finding a place for them to, to connect and be a part of it. Um, we always say, and this goes, this is just general organizing 101 is, so whoever, when folks show up, give them something to do, empower them, give them some ownership, um, make them feel like this is part of, this is their movement too. And by doing, by giving something like real ownership of something, right? Whether, no matter, it doesn't matter what it is, find something, um, do that work of finding them some, some place to have some kind of ownership. It's a place where they can air their views or their where their their um, experiences not only um, welcomed but appreciated and again um, acted upon and so that that you're really creating that environment for openness you know 
really making, especially when someone recognized that it's not the easiest to walk into a room and be the only one that looks like you in the room. I have a lot of experience of being in those kinds of rooms and it, it, it's very uncomfortable. And so it's important to not, and again, please don't overdo it, like, and then make it super like weird. Um, but, but, but making, but, but doing your part to making sure that they feel comfortable, that they're, that they're not in the corner, just like, okay, is anyone going to talk to me? Right. But like, welcome them, pull them into the conversation. Um, give them a yeah, there's that balance between, you know, ignoring somebody and, uh, making them so, like, you know, tokenized, I think on the other end of the spectrum, how do you hit that? moment where you're like, hi, you know, hi, I'm Laura, you know, how can we, uh, you know, get to know what, what got you involved? What made you show up tonight? You know, that kind of well, stuff. That's what you're going to do. With, that's what you should be doing with everyone, right? That's anybody that walks in your door, if you should be doing this. It's just sometimes when people look a little different, it's harder to, it's, it, it can be hard to, or, or sometimes folks get nervous about like, I don't want to over, you know what I mean? So, but just treat them the same as you do everybody else and everybody you should be welcoming in that same way. Um, and, and that goes with, without saying with folks that, that, that may not look like you or like everybody else that's in the room. So I'm gonna pivot over to our question and answer section. Yeah. Feel free to add in any more questions. We got a couple. Um, Tracy asks, uh, how can we get the people who are self-righteous and angry for good reason to not look at the YIMBYs as if they're just helping society gentrify older neighborhoods? Because the, the great question, Tracy, and again, that comes with having those conversations and building those relationships. If, you know, if, it's hard for someone to keep to put you in a box if you're talking to them and you're saying you're agreeing with them on certain things, right? And then you're listening to what they're saying and you can point to Hey, what about this? Would it be, this kind of help answer that and solve that? Or, or this is great. Let me take this back and see if there's some, some opportunity to figure out how this can be addressed in policy at a state level or wherever project that you're working on or, or if it's a local you know, project level. Um, so it, it really comes, you just, you just got to show up and you, and you got to be willing to take that, take that mistrust and, that, and that, that, that anger because they're not really angry at you. So you can't take it personally. They're angry at the situation and, it, and, and their situation is jacked up. And so we have to give them space to vent, right? Give them space to, to, to be upset. And then we can, because that's through that conversation, we can really find out what really is the issue. We boil down what are some of the things that you really are seeing that are, that are causing drama. And then let me, let me gently help you understand where I'm coming from, what my values are, and where we see that find some common ground um, and, and, and and if we are if we are being diverse in, in, in our portfolio of the things of the issues that we tackle in the housing space, we're, if we're being di you know diverse and truly anti-racist in the policy that we try to put, put forward and the work that we're doing, we can we'll be able to point to things that will say, hey, you know what? Actually, this is something we're working on that I think supports that. What do you think about this? Can we? And, and, and would you? And I would love for your voice to be part of this discussion, right? And, 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 and inviting them to, to be part of that discussion, to, to continue the conversation um, goes a really long way. You get more bees with honey. And so show up, um, invite them, listen, invite them to be part of the conversation, a part of the dialogue. And oftentimes I say, hey, look, I, I want you to be part of the conversation. We don't have enough voices like yours that are influencing, that are, that are leaning to the conversation. You know, we wanted to be proactive in, 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 in a positive way, uh, in a respectful way. But, um, you know, we really want you to be, and don't say that though, because that sounds super patronizing, but I'm saying that you want to, you know, mirror the, 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 the way that you want their interaction to go. And so, you know, don't be um, cantankerous or don't get, don't get offended, don't get defensive. Listen and say, you know what, you're making some good points. I really want you to be part of this dialogue and, and pull them into the conversation. Um, and that, that, that'll take you a long, long way. I think one thing that I think is really to one of your points about values and like for people who are worried about gentrification, um, you know, I think gentrification is a really complicated word that we could spend like an entire one of these unpacking. But the word that's not complicated for me is displacement. And so I do, I often pivot from gentrification to displacement because displacement is what we are diametrically opposed to. And so when we're having conversations where you're, when you're trying to find that shared value, right? YIMBY 
is trying to reduce displacement. We do not want people to be pushed out of neighborhoods. And so that means how do we, you know, get more housing built, you know, what the, and I, and this is like, you know, I've had a lot of these hard conversations, right? And you're, you're talking with somebody who's like, you know, really mad to your point. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm mad about that too. It led me to the conclusion that we needed to build more in Beverly Hills and Cupertino. And that's the mission that I'm on because I think that that's what's gonna help reduce displacement in your neighborhood. And when you can put it in those frames of like, I care about this, I heard you. Mm -hmm. I care about the same thing you care about. It has led me to maybe a different conclusion, but I also agree with you on, you know, you're fighting for this. So I want to show up for the thing that I agree with you about, but it also, I want you to understand, like, this is what has directly led to what I'm fighting for is this shared value that we have. That is one of the things that I've seen people be like, oh, I just thought you were an asshole. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not just an asshole. (laughs) Um, Awesome. Well, I'll ask the next next question. Uh, William Smith says, encouraged to hear Yimby is doing more to support affordable housing. Is affordable housing a, pri- a Yimby priority or does Yimby primarily let partners take the lead on developing policy to promote subsidized affordable housing? And uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to just list a million Yimby policies in support of affordable housing? No, that's probably not what we should do. But <laughs> to that point, though, we, I mean, we take, we support almost every affordable housing. I mean, right, one of our core values is like, how do we get more resources into affordable housing? Um, and, and so we are, you know, that is very core to our work. Um, it's just, there's also a lot of folks that are already in that space. And so we, we also, you know, occupy that space of we're one of the few um, in the movement to, to really take on like missing middle housing or workforce housing, right? And, that's also a big issue as well. And so, you know, we look at the whole diaspora of the housing continuum and we try to fill in where they needs the most work, right? Um, no, 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 you didn't recreate the wheel, but we also show up for partners in support of all those, you know, everything from affordable housing to homeless. So we, we take support positions on almost everything that is, you know, um, if it's good policy, um, we're, we're about it, about it. Yeah, I think this is one where the biggest impact I've seen on, you know, affordable housing and the discourse there, it I, showing up in person to like give public comment for affordable housing is one of the things that I think we, I mean, I'm, I love it when we do it. It can be so ugly watching who comes out to oppose those projects. And I do think it's like, uh, maybe we should make it mandatory for all Yimbies. You should have to go to <laughs> really ugly hearing, especially for affordable housing or formerly homeless housing. It is such a radicalizing experience to hear the kind of crazy stuff that people say, and, you know, out of fear and you want to like understand and change the fear and prejudice that people have, but damn. And that's that's and that's one of those places where it's important for us to show up, right? And that's how we, again we 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 take care of our own narrative in terms of where where we show up. And so let's don't just show up for the missing middle housing development, show up for that affordable housing development, show up for that at homeless you know uh, services uh, development, and make sure that we're also uh, showing up in support of those uh, as well. And so that's you know called being a great ally. And so you know. That's how that's how you get your street cred, so to so to speak, is by showing up and and then being able to you know support those things that are that aren't we're not like the, our main focus, but also equally important. Yeah, or and you can be like me. I I got so into affordable housing, I married an affordable housing developer. So boom, there you go. Or you can just marry an affordable housing developer. <laughs> yeah, that's how I get street cred, right? I did it all for the street cred. Yeah, I mean, there you go. <laughs> you won't tell. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, Patsy, well, thank you so much for coming and chatting with us. Are there any last thoughts that you want to add and, and sort of get out there? No, I'd say just, um, you know, really think proactively about how you're engaging the community, how you're looking outside of the usual suspects, 
um, and really looking at folks that are really working hard every day that have been working very hard for, for you know, communities of color to try to even all these, all these gaps that, that, our, that our racist systems have, have created. And so, you know, showing up, uh, getting down, having those conversations, hearing what, you know, what, what are some of those lived experiences and letting that seat your work in that and making sure that you're elevating that as part of the priorities of what you, what you work for. And again, just get out and start having those conversations, meet people, talk to folks, um, do a little bit of research um, and, and get out there and have those conversations. Make sure you're welcoming new folks, encouraging, you know, as you're recruiting new, new Yimbies to your teams and, and chapters, et cetera, um, get out there and don't just go to the usual suspects, go out to diverse communities and pull them in. You'd be amazed how many folks out there actually are willing to get down. They just haven't been tapped on the shoulder and asked. So get out there and get to tapping on the shoulder and ask them to join you and, uh, and, and we'll be all right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who was able to join.